years since, when they go to the sacred grounds, it's uh, the anniversary of his death is concurrent with those ceremonies connecting to the ancestors. So I don't know if that's an example of what you're saying. And he also dies as a very young man. He dies 65 years old, and I'm sure he, they can, he did have diabetes, and there's other causes we could probably uh, attribute. And I'm sure Western doctors would, but I think something else was at work there. So maybe that's what you're talking about, Lewis, that there, there's some kind of uh, conspiring with spirit to find the, the right time to die? It's a great mystery. I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, Dave, do you have something to add there? I'll have to get back to you on that, Clint. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, the last question I have for you both, really, you know, I, I've been thinking about, um, you know, how do we change the story or is there a way to change the story of modern medicine? Because people are pretty fixated on this idea that we're, that we're making progress all the time, that, that the medicine of today is better than the medicine 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But I remember reading this article in a newspaper about 10 years ago where it said, we're going to have new hospitals. You know, they're going to have uh, lots of windows, fresh air and sunlight. And my first thought is, oh, that's like a sanitarium in the Middle Ages. So, so uh, you know, where they did understand that there was a relationship between, like Dave was saying earlier, between wholeness, holiness, and health. So, I mean, is there a way that we can change the story of just linear progress to medicine because I, I, I at least in my opinion it seems like it's a kind of a dangerous myth to believe in um, or if you wish if you feel that there's a lot of truth to the idea that they're making a lot of progress please uh, stand up for that <laughs> and I <laughs> it's funny you mentioned 10 years ago because there was this study 10 years ago that came out that said Given that you live to the age of five, your life expectation is the same today as it was in 1905. Mm -hmm. And which suggests that most of our success has been up, you know, dealing with young children. Yes. But I, you know, I want to say a couple words about what we're doing at Wabanaki sure. Public Wellness because we are trying to figure out how to do medicine. Um, from both an indigenous and a um, non-indigenous perspective, two-eyed seeing. And um, I think it can be done. You know, we're doing it. And part of how we can do it is that we're, we're not trying to make profit. So, and we have grants, you know, which helps. Um, and I can see people for as long as I want. So I'm, I don't have to, I'm not constrained to 15 minute visits. Um, we're working on a, building an urban Indian health center. And our vision is to have a central, a central gathering space instead of a waiting room. Because you don't come to wait, you come to gather. And, and we don't, you know, want um, people behind glass walls who check you in, you know, and then send you to the corner to sit and wait. We want interactive dialogue going on continually, you know, with, with the opportunities for the visits being around the, in the periphery. And um, so we want to change the vision, even architecturally. You know of how this is done and there's there's two places in the world who are doing this so i don't want to claim that we're original there's thunderbird house in winnipeg and there's an anishinaabe health center uh, whose name i can't pronounce because i don't speak 
Anishinaabe in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and so uh, which is smaller than Winnipeg. So people are people are playing with these ideas, and I think you know the difficulty is that our healthcare system is really good at what it does, which is to generate a profit. It's not very good at keeping people healthy or getting them healthy because that's not what it's designed to do. Mm. You know, and, and if you look at what is it designed to do, it does it very well. Mm. So, you know, we have to change the design. Mm. Beautiful. And how do people find out more about your work, Lewis? What is your website? Well, we have um, the usual three W's, <laughs> mel-madrona.com, and we have um, three W's dot coyote-institute.org. And um, the place where I work has a website, uh, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. And uh, we have a journal called Etuoptimunk and uh, the Journal of Two-Eyed Seeing. And uh-huh. the first book too just came out. So I invite people to to look for our journal. Awesome. And, uh, as you mentioned, there's the YouTube video podcasts and the Spotify audio podcasts and all, all that crazy stuff that we just keep pumping out. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I turn it back to to you, Dave, and tell us about what you've been able to do in in your position in the uh, primary care mental health integration at Puget Sound. So I'll tell you it's something that I'm part of. It's not not mine in any way, but. Um, one of the reasons I came back to VA was I heard that there was an initiative to include complementary and integrative health in, in the VA system. And since 2012, there's been this Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation. So one of the kind of mottos that they have is to shift from saying, what's the matter with you to what matters to you? So this idea of whole health, there's a circle of health, which... Um, you know, is is kind of this universal healing symbol that the circle that brings the pieces together. And there's, you know, body and surroundings and diet and sleep and, and um, relationships, all those sort of things you might expect there. There's also spirit and soul. So we have kind of permission and encouragement to talk with veterans about spirit and soul because it's part of this whole health movement. So part of my job as a national education champion is going around to different VAs and teaching different courses on um, how to use the idea of whole health. And because it's not disease focused, it's uh, wellness focused, it applies equally to clients as well as to staff. So we'll often kind of balance our teaching of like, here's how you use it for yourself. Now that you know how to use it for yourself, here's how you can use it with veterans. So the movement, you know, this whole health initiative with office patient centered care and cultural transformation has really, um, you know, it's persisted. It's grown um, 18 VAs across the country, got three to five million dollars to kind of develop as pilot sites to develop these different um, modalities uh, to bring in like peer support specialists, um, health coaches, as well as to have Tai Chi and yoga and acupuncture and meditation. Um, even there was a, a, a study going on at our VA. Uh, by one of the the GI docs on loving kindness meditation, teaching veterans loving kindness meditation. And at first I thought, wow, that's going to be a tough sell. But then I thought, well, that's exactly what they need. You know, after, after going to war, war training for war is kind of the opposite of loving kindness in a way. So loving kindness seems the perfect antidote to war. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's invigorating to be part of this model, but this is why I say I feel both inside and outside of the system. When I'm with my whole health people, you know, we all think in similar ways and we're all trying to bring this transformation into the system. But then when you talk with service line chiefs and section chiefs and directors, you know, they're trying to see, well, is this some just new VA kind of initiative that we can ignore? Hmm. Uh, or, 
or a common thing, two common misunderstandings. This is about complementary and integrative health. So this is about somebody doing acupuncture or meditation or something, but we say, no, those, those come out of a philosophy of, of care and relationship. And so it's this cultural transformation piece. The other thing is leadership will sometimes think, well, this is something that um, healthcare workers do to veterans. Um, mm. Instead of thinking, no, this is something, a way that everybody interacts with everyone else, how they care for themselves and how they care for the whole institution. So I think the dilemma at this point, though, is we've got this, um, you know, there's there's a ton of information available through the VA website for if you just um, put in a search engine, VA whole health. There's a, a, a ton of information there for practitioners and veterans and free resources, all sorts of different things. Um, but I think the dilemma now is once this has become an office and an institution within an institution, is will the cultural transformation be that whole health transforms the VA or that the VA transforms whole health and we become a siloed um, kind of ineffective institution or, or an ineffective kind of department within the institution. And I think about this even, Lewis, with your story about the, the um, clinic in um, Pennsylvania of this idea, you know, Jerry Arbuckle, who's a Catholic priest and an anthropologist, talks about the need for refounding, that institutions periodically lose touch with their, their founding principles. And sometimes the very success of an institution can be the thing that then creates its downfall. So unless you can have a refounding pathway that happens where someone goes back to the original spirit of the institution and can kind of give birth again to or rebirth for the institution to grow into a new uh, metamorphosis in, in the present situation, um, the institution can become irrelevant or, or be swept aside. So you really need ceremonies of renewal. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, what you were saying about the, the VA, um, you know, it brought to mind two things. One, I wonder if you've read the book by James Hillman, A Terrible Love of War. Uh, that, that's a good one. Um, and uh, the, the other thing is, you know, the uh, veterans can... You said loving kindness is not ordinarily thought about, but bonding is, you know, bond, you know, bonding, you know, the people, people in the military do make very close bonds. So, yeah. Um, so, Dave, uh, how can people find out about uh, your work? Uh, oh, with? sure. Yeah, I've got a, a website, davidcopaz.com. Um, and I've also got a blog called Being Fully Human. Oh, well, that's a question I would like to ask for another day. You know, what does it mean to be human? We don't have quite enough time to go into that, but that's uh, that was opened up. Um, I, I have a lot of admiration, respect for both of you. This has really been a beautiful dialogue. Thank you very much for the work you do in the world. Um, thank you for your deep thoughts, your compassion, your kindness, and your persistence and perseverance in, in creating a pathway. And I hope and pray that you'll be an example for others to come along and, uh, 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 and follow this pathway as we go into the future, because you really are uh, great explorers, adventurers, and you've been successful in what you're doing. So thank you so much for being on the circle for original thinking today.